Afternoon, everyone. The, uh, it started snowing outside, so you don't have to worry about anything going on out there. And they're, they're keeping the refreshments warm and cold outside, so you have that to look forward to. Uh, we get a chance to uh, very quickly go through the emergency department. How many of you are involved in a project now to renovate, redesign, or, or rebuild your emergency department? Can I see some hands? That's a pretty significant amount, and, and it seems that we're all in that. Uh, and why is that? Well, here we go. Uh, people are coming to the emergency department, and uh, you'll get a lot more data tomorrow morning. Uh, but uh, despite our best efforts to give people other places to go, to tell them they shouldn't come to the emergency department, uh, over the last, uh, what is that, 25 years now almost, uh, we've been told the insurance companies, the urgent care centers, the ACOs, the HMOs, and everybody is going to take all your patients away. Are any of you worried right now about patients leaving your emergency department in large numbers to go find someplace else? I don't think it's there, and, I, and I'm sorry, I believe in everything that our prior speakers have said, and I'm going to talk about some alternative models, but the public has told us they like coming to see us, and they like coming when they want and for what they want, and the more we tell them not to come, what happens? The more they come. Now, things happen, okay? And if you look at this number, uh, 2011 is the last official data we have. Uh, the CDC has not been able to report for the last five years on data. Uh, the NAHAMSA study, which many of you know I come every year to talk to this conference about NAHAMSA numbers, uh, they, they have not been released since 2011. Uh, we're waiting, waiting, waiting for the 2012 numbers to show up, now only four years late. The CDC says they're not confident in the data. Linda McKaig, who some of you knew, came last year to talk to us. Uh, she's retired after running this study since 1992. Uh, at least some have speculated that the CDC will not be funded for this study any longer, and it's no surprise that the numbers aren't being released. Why? Who would be unhappy with those numbers? The current administration of our country is not happy that these numbers are going up. And that supposedly is resulting in no funding and re is resulting in you coming here, figuring ways to take care of all the people who still come to see you. Let me, let me preempt my, my later talk in saying I believe that we will find places for some people to go to get their low acuity medical care in our communities. And I will be thankful for the day that people have a place to go to get unscheduled care in their primary care physician's offices or clinics. Some of you are in communities where you may have opportunities to, to get patients into real care after they see you once or twice. Uh, and I'll be thankful many of you don't have primary care and aren't going to have enough for the next coming years uh, to be able to shift them off. And I don't believe there's any large bolus of really sick patients who are now going to the minute clinic and getting their care who are going to come to you. Uh, so our volume issues continue to be our demographics, and that's, that's what's driving the ED show, is we have an older, sicker medical population, they're coming to see you because that's where they need to get their care. How are we going to design the emergency departments to take care of them? That's my next 20 minutes, hopefully. EDs are getting bigger, and the Benchmarking Alliance, uh, thank all of you who are members of the Benchmarking Alliance. We originally designed the Benchmarking Alliance 20 years ago, for the ED seeing 100 patients a day, 40,000 volume was a critical number for many of us. We were at the breaking point at 100 patients a day. We created the Benchmarking Alliance to serve the needs of over 40,000 EDs. What is the average ED in the, in the United States now see? 40 grand. We have 55 members of the Alliance that are 100,000 plus. The largest ED I, I have seen in the country through a single set of doors is in Lakeland, Florida. Anybody here from Lakeland? Uh, they saw 764 patients last March in one day through one set of doors. So whenever you want to whine, <laughs> Lakeland, Florida, their average now is about 550 a day in 12 pods. All right. So older, sicker, medical, more complex medical workups, functional information technology. Everybody has that right on your lips, right? You can talk about functional information technology in your ED. Ha! Huh. Not there. Uh, more people need to stay disinfected, including your staff, right? So another design consideration. More family and more demand for safety. Uh, this is uh, by all of our various cohorts, and all of you know about in the Benchmarking Alliance, we, we have used cohorts. 
20,000 volume cohorts is a really good uh, set of cohorts to apply to emergency department populations, has been for at least the last 30 years, all right? And uh, it appears across those cohorts uh, that this is the number of, of patients seen per, per bed space or per bed, depending on how you measure those, those uh, places, those physical places in your emergency department. The problem is that every CEO went to CEO school and they were trained that the number is 2,000 patients per bed. It's 2,000 from CEO school and it's wrong, all right? And your job is to have the numbers that we give you today and tomorrow because designing your ED, when you, when you go to them and begin the design process, uh, for those of you who have significant adult populations, uh, adults mean longer ED stays, means you need more beds to take care of them. If you see a lot of children or your children's hospital, you can move patients more quickly through the beds because they have lower acuity, lower length of stay, lower use of CT and EKGs and other things that take time in the emergency department. Get the picture? Uh, anyway, the number that you start to design from is typically one patient care space or one bed per 1,200 visits. That's the real number, all right? Uh, and if too few beds, uh, you have poor flow and high left before treatment complete. If you look at square footage, uh, those of you from the Northeast know that you oftentimes are working in really tight little emergency departments. Uh, in the South and in the Midwest, oftentimes we have much more spacious emergency departments. Uh, if your ED is too small space-wise, you have high infectious crossover, both patient to patient and patient to staff. And typically the complaints are it's too noisy and you get some privacy complaints and you get some complaints about what your staff were talking about rather than taking care of patients, right? Everybody familiar with that? If your ED is too large, you have communication problems and wayfinding challenges. Uh, and that's when you need maps and lines on the floor or fish on the floor that uh, tell you where to go in the emergency department or tell the, the, uh, the uh, family members uh, where to go in the emergency department. And then you need to start wiring your staff like I'm wired here <laughs> or with radios or, or uh, uh, the other devices that allow us to stay in communication. Bluetooth, that's what I was trying to think of. All right, and then in our design, of course, technology is one piece. And the second piece is what happened to us over the last couple of years, which is things like Ebola. And what are you going to do when the Ebola patient presents to your emergency department? How do you safely manage the patient? How do you safely uh, protect your staff? Uh, staffing. Uh, staffing certainly has an input on design. And you certainly want to make your staff efficient. We are seeing some changes in staffing and staffing productivity. What hasn't changed recently is productivity of nursing which is locked in about the 0.6 patients per provider hour. What we're seeing a switch over is how many of you are hiring new clerks for the ED? Don't think anybody is because they're being replaced with techs because the clerks have now been replaced by order entry and communication systems that don't require the same number of clerking hours. Uh, and then the walk around wheels if registration clerks are within your, within your uh, cost center in the emergency department. Uh, you have much more efficient ways to use your registration clerking people as well. Physicians uh, and physicians plus APPs uh, are becoming, uh, actually, we, we've probably gone through the nadir of physician productivity with implementation of technology that didn't make it easy to see patients. We're probably at the point where the physicians and APPs can become a little more efficient as we make the information systems work better for them. All right, so let's talk about design in terms of the process of patients. So the first thing that happens is you greet the patients. What can we do in the greeting area through design to improve flow? Uh, well, we, we change the process so that time to provider shrinks. And when time to provider shrinks, people stay, they don't walk away. You get them plugged in earlier. They get labbed and locked, and they get appropriately assigned to resources in the back. Or they get appropriately assigned to the results waiting area and never get to see the back, which is a really good outcome for many of those patients. And uh, if, they, if they are in the front, then you have a competition between the registration people, the nursing uh, discipline, and the physician or APP discipline as to who gets uh, movement through with the patient and the family first. That's frankly a very good thing and it results in big redesign changes in the front of the emergency department. So it's no longer a waiting room wall. Uh, it's instead greeting area, 
and staff moving efficiently and hopefully what used to be square footage wasted in the front as a waiting area is now productive patient movement area and it becomes a result waiting area or results pending area uh, for those patients that you can manage like that. One of our benchmarking alliance partners a long time ago created this intake area which they call shoots, C-H-U-T-E-S, okay, shoots which are staffed, an appropriate number of them, as the day goes on. And those chutes have a stand-up workstation. And people coming into the emergency department, their, their EDC is between 300 and 320 a day. Uh, they come through, get their quick reg. Uh, they, get, they get processed very quickly as far as what their medical needs are. And whether they come through walking, uh, through on a wheelchair, or in some cases through on a stretcher, uh, they can move through the chutes area very quickly. The only patients not coming through the chutes are the patients coming in the back end, either off the helicopter or off the ambulance. All right? And uh, this, frankly, uh, allows one more design element to be put in place. Uh, in Washington, D.C. now, uh, you probably know the entrance doors to the emergency department have radiation detectors there to make sure that people don't accidentally come in uh, with, with radiation contamination that the staff doesn't know about yet. Uh, what do you think happens in a, in a radiation therapy patient when they walk through? Or a thyroid cancer patient who's loaded up with radioactive iodine, it lights up the alarm systems. Uh, in the future, I believe that we will have infectious disease uh, sniffers uh, that will be doing the same thing in the entrance to the emergency department. And if you run them through that funnel in the, in the front and then run them through chutes in the back, or in the, in the front of the processing area, that will allow people to efficiently get to the back uh, where they will get their definitive care and treatment, all right? Uh, so we could have intake systems uh, designed to be very open in the front, uh, to use technology like registration kiosks so that people can continue to move very quickly. Uh, the greeting team then includes either physicians or APPs, uh, and, and as you go through various volumes and times a day, uh, that, that uh, team in the front may flux. But the idea, again, is to put people in the back who need to go in the back fairly quickly, uh, be able to lab and lock many, many, many other patients that we see in the front end, and then as quickly as possible, both diagnostics and treatment get done, initiated from the front. So I gave you a, slot that, uh, a slide that has uh, some of the numbers that you need. Uh, we're seeing more fast tracks being built into emergency departments. We're seeing in the, in the higher volume emergency departments, trauma and resuscitation areas being built. And we're seeing uh, what Mike just talked about, which is clinical decision units or observation units as a design function of the emergency department as we're building these sites. Uh, this is the actual numbers uh, that I showed you on the, on the uh, slide earlier. Uh, these are actual numbers about visits per square foot and visits per patient care space. So our challenge, if you're, if you're doing a renovation or redesign, is to uh, focus on flow, plan forward. There's nothing that in most markets would indicate to you that there's going to be a volume drop. Now, there may be places where you are intentionally designing satellite hospitals, freestanding emergency departments to try to decompress the mothership, whatever the mothership is. And those EDs may anticipate some volume drop, or stabilization at least. Uh, many of you are worried that your, your competitor hospital is going to close, or that in system affiliation, uh, they're going to go down, and all of a sudden you're going to get bolused with 30 or 35,000 patients into your existing emergency department. Uh, so there are some of these that are self-fulfilling prophecies. Uh, but at this point, unless, are there any children's ED people in here? Can you raise your hands? There are a few of you. Now, you can close your, uh, your ears for just a moment. The rest of you are becoming geriatric EDs, all right? Just so everybody knows, we don't have to design a special unit for geriatrics. We design the entire unit for geriatrics, except for you guys who work at children's hospitals. Uh, the rest of us absolutely positively are becoming senior-oriented emergency departments. If your volume is such that you have 25% peds, in some cases you design a pediatric area, a pediatric track when you get to a certain volume number, uh, and, and you have elements that make a room friendly to children and their siblings, that's usually your problem area, uh, is dealing with the siblings. The rest of you need to design for senior patients because that's what's coming to us. 
We are, uh, the, the, the mission that the board will give you in your redesign, we want it to be customer friendly. We want it to be flow focused. Don't make mistakes. Don't get people infected, either other patients or the staff. Uh, and make it efficient so that you don't need roller skates or segways to get around. Is that, is that a fair enough mission statement? So you design a mission statement. You look to other places in the hospital that may have design cues for you. And the best place to look is labor and delivery, which typically is beautiful. It's laid out with plenty of volume. As many of you hear me say year after year, there is no diversion of labor and delivery. There is no acceptance of patient care in the hallway in labor and delivery. They are the other front door to the hospital. Somehow they got special dispensation from the healthcare pope that said they don't have to deliver care in the hallway. They think we're obscene, by the way, for what we do taking care of people in the hallways. All right? So go upstairs and take a look and see how they're designed and, and what might work very well for you in your ED. And if they don't have care going on in the hallway, then you go back to your designers and say, if they ain't doing it up there, we're not doing it down here. Design us with enough rooms that we can take care of people seven days a week, 24 hours a day, in rooms where they belong and where it's safe to deliver care if they need, a, if they need care in a room. Uh, build it with, an ex, with enough volume. <laughs> Uh, build it for acuity, build it with a greeting area, build it as much as possible with uniform, universal treatment design rooms uh, so that you don't have a whole lot of specialty rooms. Many of the specialty functions can be cared for with a cart, an ortho cart, an ENT cart, a euro cart, uh, etc. You do need a couple of special areas uh, for mental health care and for resuscitation, that, that's very clear. And some of you, again, with enough pediatric volume, know that if you design things that are higher and you don't have stuff that the kids uh, can get into in the rooms, it minimizes safety issues and it mi minimizes cleanup done afterwards. If you have flexible sub-waiting areas, what they would call results pending areas, or results waiting areas that oftentimes are chaired, uh, or, or use the big sit-up chairs uh, that many of the senior patients really, really like as opposed to stretchers, uh, that gives you tons of flexibility. For those of you who are in communities where there's a lot of mental health, you really need to have a mental health suite. That suite is designed with safe rooms, safe for the patients, safe for your staff, equipped and, and furnitured uh, for the safety, and, and with, uh, with the ceiling that, that people can't hang themselves from, with things that can't be ignited, et cetera. That's a mental health suite. Uh, and then we, we build CDU pods because Mike's, Mike's talk, what Sherry will talk about later, is really important that we be able to do this uh, clinical decision unit functioning. If your hospital wants to do it upstairs, that's fine. A lot of pediatric hospitals have established that upstairs is going to be their CDU. But for many of you, our, our, our future is a clinical decision unit close to the emergency department. Uh, you have to have surge capacity, and I won't talk too much about that here, but you have to be able to take care of disasters in your community. If you're a tsunami community, a tornado community, a hurricane community, uh, a, a wildland fire community, a blackout community, you have to look at your hazard vulnerability analysis for the institution and be prepared to accept and deal with those patients. There really is no excuse for that anymore, and you'll get crucified in the literature if you're not prepared for that. Even a place like Joplin, Missouri, which built the best uh, backup generator setup in the world uh, that's above ground, because remember Katrina, they were flooded if they were below ground, so they put one above ground in a big hardened building, and an F4 tornado comes through and wipes out the electricity, wipes out the generator, sucks the generator out the, uh, out the wall of the building, and they were crucified in the media for their poor planning. So there's some of this you can't avoid, but you got to do the best. And then I'm going to talk to you, you know, we do bubble designs, and, uh, and we got to figure out this, this after Ebola, we have to figure out this, how to deal with contaminated, dirty, or potentially infectious patients. And uh, frankly, we have come to this realization that you need to have a utility room, that is designed for dirty people, okay? And those dirty people can be construction workers who come in with a laceration <laughs> and covered in mud. Uh, it, they can be hazmat contaminated patients. 
They can be our future Ebola patients. Uh, they can be patients who walk in with scabies, lice, chicken pox, uh, or our friend, and you guys as ED leaders friend, which is the bed bug, okay? The all-time ultimate changer of nursing behavior in my career <laughs> is the bed bug, okay? I lived through the 80s, we designed all this hazmat stuff, and there, there was every ED in this country, every region in this country had one ED uh, that accepted a dirty patient who was walked in the front door and walked into somewhere and they contaminated the entire ED and there's a headline about that ED being shut down uh, because hazmat contamination was strewn through the emergency department. Uh, lice patients who, who locked down, uh, they brought in their conventional way and put into a room, et cetera. Uh, and then, what was it, eight, nine years ago, probably not that long ago, bed bugs. And our nursing staff in Cincinnati was completely grossed out by the concept of a bed bug coming in. Long time in the ED, probably seen 100,000 patients, never seen anything bad ever related to a bed bug. Okay, but the nursing staff's terrified, so we said, you know, we've got this decon room. It's a dirty room, and if you think somebody has a bed bug coming in by EMS or walk in, you take them over to the decon room entrance outside. You tell, walk back outside to there. We're going to leave your belongings out there. Uh, security's going to tie them up, and then we're going to walk you in. We're going to disrobe you in the decon room. We're going to clean you off, and then we're going to deliver your medical care sometimes in the decon room and then we're gonna send you back out, meet your belongings, and go back home. Stunning, stunning idea that we would do that. Now, we've been trying for 86 years to do that for hazmat and for, and for physically dirty patients and all that. Never got the message across, okay? The bed bug changed the entire, the entire teaching message, all right? So, this is what the, the, the mud room looks like. Dirty and clean channels, one room, but staff coming in the back clean, they, they interact with the potentially Ebola patient. That was our, our latest real big challenge with this. And for those that were going to uh, evaluate and ship, they never made it out of the mudroom. Okay? And in other cases, they were going to be evaluated, cleaned, made safe, then transported either into another emergency department bed or into the Ebola accepting area upstairs. Get the idea, this is a really good thing to use as a standard design for dirty patients. Everybody else who follows, scabies, lice, chicken pox, meningococcus, extremely drug resistant tuberculosis, whatever it is, nurses got the message, dirty stuff goes back outside and comes back in through the dirty room. All right, uh, in the mud room, uh, these are the design elements, these are available to you. This is, this is really entrance system two that you have to design in any new emergency department. All right, so let's talk uh, about the ED, and, and very quickly, I want to break this up into a couple different channels. Uh, the biggest design challenges are, again, the 40,000 up emergency departments. Uh, and 40,000 plus, these are some of the solutions being developed. It's, it's direct to bed, flow uh, in the daytime hours, security, and all of us have security challenges and, and things that would really be disastrous for our EDs. Uh, and a little bit about transfer out for any sick patients that have to go somewhere else. For the 40 to 60,000 volume EDs, uh, we have to become reliant on the EDIS to begin to flow the patients through. Uh, this is typically where the team triage concepts begin to build, is at 40,000 volume. Uh, we look at reducing boarding times, which are our ultimate enemy in terms of flow through the emergency department. Uh, avoiding diversion, always critically important, and then beginning to, again, incorporate the concepts of a clinical decision unit. When we get to 60,000 volumes, uh, we're looking at the flow, particularly in the daytime and evening hours, uh, beginning to add things like uh, mental health suites, and clearly at 60,000 volume is when you need internal flex flow areas. Uh, you've seen some of the design models. Uh, all of us essentially in this room have grown up in the model of multiple pods. And, and the pod, that, that's my comfort zone. <laughs> I don't like big, long EDs where I can't see people. I don't like EDs that have a core area here and, and spokes going out in a way that I can't see the patients and I don't know whether they didn't leave or there's a problem going on in one of the rooms or I'm down one of the spokes when there's a problem occurring in another spoke. 
There are some of the new I-beam designs, uh, which if you've come to our prior uh, ED design conferences, these are where you have an internal staff work area and then an external flow corridor for families. Works real well in children's hospitals where siblings are kept outside. Great idea, huh? Keep the siblings out of the main uh, core work area for the nurses and physicians. It makes for a quieter, more efficient emergency department. Uh, and, and as they refer to us, this is an ED that breathes. Uh, during the core uh, early morning hours, there's the, 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 um, the core area that's in use. And then during the daytime, as you get more volume in, it goes out to the farthest ends of the emergency department and then contracts again in for the night shift. Mental health suite, uh, there are some best practice designs for this. It's a double lock system. It's all video linked. Uh, it is, it is uh, configured for safety of both staff and patients. And you don't put expensive furnishings in there <laughs> and things that can be set on fire, the patient can hang themselves from or anything else that they can get into trouble with. Uh, if you have a big enough volume that patients sometimes have to stay in there for days, there's toileting and storage and a work area for your social service or psych crisis worker to work. If you're over 100,000, there's another set of, of, uh, of uh, both answers and design considerations that come into play for pediatric emergency departments, for adult emergency departments, the same. So I, I will finish off very quickly here with, with uh, our job in design of the EDs and with all of you, is, is to maximize our ability of staff to make the patient work, that make the place work for the patient, all right? Our design priority is to make it functional for the staff to be able to use. There should be minimal movement of patients in, in, uh, in key uh, areas of clinical use so that fast-track patients don't get a tour of the entire emergency department. Resuscitation areas have to be accessible to EMS, to the helicopters, and to movement upstairs to the ORs and intensive care units. Uh, fast track should be somewhere near x-ray because that's the, the most important diagnostic that you have in the fast track. Mental health patients should be in an area made for mental health, not in an area that otherwise is taking care of critical patients. A bed command center and then access to specialized flow units necessary to reduce boarding hours is a critical element uh, in the design of future emergency departments, just in line with what everybody else said. Uh, we need good logistics uh, for supplies and carts, uh, and some of you are asked to do green-friendly emergency departments. Ooh. Signage uh, for wayfinding so that your staff aren't continually guiding people through the entire system. Food service that supports everybody there. Uh, and then I, I, uh, I want you to know <laughs> Uh, my talk on Thursday is about EMS and inclusion and, and how we're going to make this into a, a friendly and effective unscheduled care environment, which is where we are. So, in, in summary for my talk, uh, design is critically important. Many of you are involved in it. Get involved early. Uh, design with a few elements related to increasing volume. Don't let anybody tell you they're going to design a smaller emergency department because your volume is going down. Make it as universal as possible and make it friendly and effective for flow. And where you need to, some specialized units for mental health, for resuscitation, for pediatrics, uh, and for dirty patients are, are really important sub-elements to consider.